happy for an ugly woman who won't disrespect her man. I'm Charles Wright again. <clears throat> and uh, I used to be the band leader for Mr. Bill Cosby. And, and I hear all these accusations about what uh, he's done to these ladies. And as I said before, I've seen dressing room full of women all outside the dressing room, inside the dressing room, trying to get next to Mr. Cosby. And, and I've seen him ignore most of them. So I, I know he ain't never had to do nothing to uh, gain sex from any of them. I just know that. Okay? And, uh, but... <clears throat> Whatever they claim he's done to them actually is nothing compared to what he's done to me. And, uh, and I love him. But um, there's two sides to every coin. And uh, let's start from the beginning. I have a letter here that says Bill Cosby important. I wrote it about three, four years ago. It's been sitting on top of my refrigerator all of that time. I have friends that have been urging me, send that letter, send that letter. But I haven't sent it because I just hate to send it to him. Because once he see the facts, uh, he's not gonna like himself anymore. I don't think too much. But anyway, as I say, I was an aspiring musician. And I was a studio musician in Hollywood in the mid-60s. And I worked with a lot of bands. And there was one band that was always headed up by one or two arrangers, Arthur Wright or James Carmichael, two great arrangers who produced some great music together. Matter of fact, James Carmichael, he ended up doing all the production on Lionel Richie and the Commodores and people like that. So one day, um, we're in there recording with this band, and Bill Cosby went in with another guy no name, Fred Smith, who was a small time producer, one of the few black producers, first black producers in Los Angeles. So Warner Brothers had apparently contracted him to uh, record, to produce Cosby's first singing albums. So they came in the studio and they stayed all day. And they, and when they left, they announced to us that they had seen several bands, but we were the band that they had chose to do Cosby's first single. So two weeks later, we're in the studio recording a song called Little Old Man. It's, uh, actually, Stevie Wonder's uh, Uptight was the music for it, but we redid it uh, with Mr. Cosby. And it was a hit record. Next thing I know, we're recording a couple of albums with Mr. Cosby. Meanwhile, I'm working in the studio in the daytime now, okay? But at night, I have a band. I mean, Slide Famous, the Stone, and my band were the, probably the two greatest bands on the West Coast at the time. And we were working in the nightclub. Well, Mr. Cosby came to see us, and he wanted us to start being my band personal band start being his backup band on the shows. And uh, so that's what we started doing, uh, backing him up when he uh, performed. And I, a after a while, he went his way. He got us a contract with Warner Brothers. And, uh, to make it clear, the guy Fred Smith, I'm talking about the, the producer, he came up with the name the Watts Hearn Third Street Rhythm Band. And uh, and he produced some music on the, the first two albums on the Watts Hearn Third Street Rhythm Band, but it was all, most all of it was instrumental. And actually the band, now we go on the road, Warner Brothers sent us on the road with Richard Pryor to, uh, uh, to, to demonstrate our ability to disc jockeys and stuff. And uh, uh, we would go, and the disc jockeys, after we performed, they said, man, what are you guys sending us these records for when you guys do all of this? You know, so 
finally, uh, the president of Warner Brothers called me, and he got reports of what we were doing out there, and he, he wondered why I wasn't singing on none of the records. And so he invited me and Mr. Fred Smith in the office to, uh, to discuss the situation because he figured I should be producing some of the music on the albums, our next album. Well, Fred, he's, <laughs> Fred, I love Fred, but Fred had a quick trigger and he didn't know nothing about money. He didn't even know how to ask for money. He produced some hit records around here and never gained anything because he didn't know how to ask for money. And he sat there and said, you know, some of the man said, well, what, we'd like to get the Charles. He says immediately, now, I want out of the whole situation. Just give me $5,000. I said, $5,000, man, that ain't no money. Don't do that. Give me $5,000. He's playing the horses. He's really hung up on the horses. <clears throat> and so I said, no, don't do this. But uh, immediately, the president of Warren Brothers, he said, tell the college secretary, said, write check to Fred, check the $5,000. I said, no, no, don't do this, Fred. So he's Fred sold him our name, that name, for $5,000. I begged Fred all the way home, please, man, don't do this. But he was, he just, he was stubborn, hard-headed. And like I say, I love him, but that's what he did. So now, Cosby, I, I suspect Fred had a very jealous wife. She hated me. She was just jealous. So I think she enticed Fred into doing something like this. <clears throat> so Warner Brothers, now they own the name. So now they want me to to produce the records. So I go out and I produce the record. I put Fred's name on the record still. I produce the records and we had our first big record. So anyway, so then Cosby, at, at, uh, he went his way. He kinda, we kind of went our way for a while there. Then suddenly he wanted us back on the road with him again. So we met him. In Houston, Texas. First night we met him in Houston, yeah. And, you know, when at that point, you know, my band, I had, I would go out and do about four or five songs with my band, and I'd go off, change my clothes, come back and put on a show. <clears throat> Cosby won us in that night, just walked up on the stage, where's Charles? Uh, so, the, uh, my saxophone player said he's in the dressing room. What are you doing? He's getting, he's chasing. Said I want Charles out here right now. So I, you know, like the Lord fool I am, I didn't change the clothes. Just came right on back, came up on stage, and he and played. He kind of insulted me a little bit. But anyway, we played because he he's telling me. Uh, I, he didn't think I should be coming out there doing a show on my own. So the next night, he told his manager, Roy Silver, to tell us to wait behind the stage while he performed. He's going to go on first. So he went on first, and he performed. And then he called us up. We went up and turned that place topsy-turvy, okay? The place was in pandemonium. And when we got through, he came out, aren't they great? Aren't they great? Yeah, yeah, they're great, yeah. So he turns to my drummer, who's a triple Gemini, <laughs> he says, man, he says, all right, James, I want you to put some pee, get your water boiling in the pot. So when the drummer's sitting there with the sticks, you don't know what to do. So I started riffing one of the songs we do with. He turns to me and says, Charles, shut up. I'll tell you when you can, when you can sing again. Or play again, actually. I said, okay. So then he tells the bass player, put some, come on, Mel, put some peas in the pot. Mel don't know what to do. He's standing there, so I played the riff. Charles, I told you to shut up. I'll tell you when you can play again. I mean, here I am. I had these people in heaven. He's standing there, something me like that. And then he calls the other guitar player, Al McCabe. Come on, Al. 
Elk came in and started playing. Then he called the horn section in. And here I stand like a dummy through the whole scene while he sang a song. Then he walks off the stage. He brought that crowd from uh, Utopia down to the lower floor that night. And, and we all just walked off the stage. So, now, unfortunately, it seems like everything I do since then has turned to dirt. So now, Cosby, when he had his Dr. Huxtable show, he was gonna, he was announced to be at the Hollywood Bowl uh, MC in the jazz show there. So I called him up, actually, and, uh, no, actually what I did, I wrote him a letter at that time. And I said, Cosby, yo, I want to know why you did what you did to me when you did what you did to me. He says, oh, come up to the Hollywood Bowl on Sunday and we'll discuss it. So I go to the bowl. Now, the reason I know he's my problem is because when I went to the bowl that Sunday, I went in his dressing room. Now, he's two years older than me, at least. He said, Charles, I said, you're too old to be in show business anymore. Couldn't drive. So I left the dressing room feeling bad, but feeling like somehow I was strong enough to overcome it, whatever he put in place. But uh, so far I haven't. And to me, that's my life. That's my career. That's my livelihood. God takes care of me because he gave me a song <laughs> to even express yourself. If it wasn't for that, I would have drowned a long time ago. So what he done to them girls for a few minutes, if he did anything to me, which I do not believe, okay? I honestly don't believe that. He had too many women at his his disposal. That and, and, and he had a beautiful wife. And I think that was one of the reasons he was ignoring those chicks. But uh, I don't believe he did that. And if he did, that's nothing compared to what he did to me. And you know what I'm talking about, Cosby. And I still love you, man. I do. Honestly, I do. But right is right. Whether you spell it W-R-I-G-H-T or R-I-G-H-T. And wrong is wrong. Now, I can frankly understand, believe it or not, why you did what you did. Except for one thing. You never came to me and asked me my side of the story. And that's where you went off. Because what I'm just expressing is exactly what happened. I'm sorry, man. I love you, but I've been forced to the wall. Thank you. Looking for the ugly woman who won't disrespect her man. Looking for an ugly woman. Pretty women, they think they slick. Looking for an ugly woman.